Uh, the Reverend Ogi is one of this new breed of Japanese priests who are working to find ways of connecting Buddhism with the lives of uh, people in Japan in the 21st century. Uh, he was uh, born in Yamaguchi Ken uh, and he is now the, uh, the vice uh, incumbent of uh, George Oji in, in uh, Yam near Yamaguchi uh, City. But he left Japan to study. He, after completing a B.A. at Ryukoku University, he came to the Bay Area and he studied at uh, Graduate Theological Union and the Institute for Buddhist Studies and did an MA here. And then he went to Harvard and spent a year as a visiting researcher before going back to Japan. And he's been using, since then, he's been using his international experience to find new ways of reaching out and, and, and bringing Buddhism up to date, as it were, uh, using all kinds of media. And so he's written a number of books, uh, including, for example, uh, Cho Kantan Ego De Bukyo, something like that, Wakaru. You know. <laughs> and then there's the book which is of special interest to me, Yakusenai Nihongo, um, Japanese that you can't translate, which is the variety that I speak, and, uh, and, and, and so on. And, uh, but more publicly, of course, is his television program. Uh, Butchakeji, and I looked for Butchake in the dictionary and couldn't find it, but <laughs> is it like Butsuke? Or being frank? Being frank, right? So, so the Reverend Ogi translates the name of the TV program as Being Frank, Being Frank Temple, mm -hmm. uh, but that's a rather ambiguous title in English because it could be about a, a guy called Frank Temple, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think perhaps a, a nicer translation would be sort of straight from the hip, or talking straight, or telling it like it is temple, I think. And so we're happy to have you here tonight to tell it like it is and tell us about the, the present and the future of Japanese Buddhism. So, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Hello. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Harrison and Dr. Irene Ling and then the organizer of this lecture for even inviting me to be here today. Um, my secular name is Naoyuki Ogi, and I work for Bukkyo Dendo Kyokai, uh, the Society for the Promotion of Buddhism, more commonly known as BDK or the Numata Foundation in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, however, I have uh, also another name, uh, Shoujun Ogi, like that, Shoujun Ogi. Uh, this is my Dhamma name as a Shin Buddhist priest from my Choshoji Temple in Yamaguchi, Japan. Besides being employee at BDK, I also work uh, as a translator and a writer as well as a Shin Buddhist priest. I'm grateful uh, for the many conditions that have enabled me to come to Stanford and join with you this evening. Today, I'm speaking to you as a Shin Buddhist priest and then not as an employee of BDK. So my comments and opinions I share with you today is my, uh, my personal reflection and feelings and then not those of my employer. So today, my topic is the refocusing Buddhism in modern Japanese society, the new dimensions in contemporary Japanese Buddhism. So I'd like to share with you how various new activities, concepts, and then emphasis have come into being in uh, contemporary Japanese Buddhist world, especially amongst young Buddhist priests in contemporary Japan. So in order to set the background for the, my message, so in order to introduce the various innovative activity in Japanese Buddhism, so please allow me to share a little about the history of Japanese Buddhism. Um, then I talk a little about what today's Japanese Buddhist priests are doing and then what I myself see as my role in changing scene of today's Japanese Buddhism. And then as a conclusion, I will share the, with you some idea of what I see as the future of Japanese Buddhism. So before moving on, let me introduce myself. Uh, I was born in the, into a, a Honganji sect Shin Buddhist temple uh, located in a fa small, fami um, small village in the southwest part of Japan, Yamaguchi. I think uh, for, most for you, much easier to understand, next Hiroshima, it's the last part of the Honshu, the main island of Japan. So and then my parents are Buddhist priests, but they are also working outside of the temple. My father works at the prefectural department of overseeing senior uh, nursing care home. And then my mother works at the, the courthouse. 
So since my temple is quite small and then does not have many temple members, and my parents find it, find it uh, necessary to uh, work outside the temple to financially support my temple and then our families during weekdays. And for them, temple work is kind of a part-time job, mostly done on weekends. And however, they bring the teaching of Buddha to their jobs and their working environment. So many people trust them and then come to visit my temple to get advice and support from my parents when trouble arises. I grew up under these circumstances, and then so I thought uh, it was only normal that Buddhist priests have to study various areas in order to be, uh, in order to uh, uh, be able to support and encourage many people who are enduring life through various problems and situations. For me to only study how to conduct funeral ritual and then chanting did not have any meaning nor serve any purpose for those in society who are suffering or in need. And therefore, with this vision and inspiration from my parents' own ethic of serving the community, I went to Ryukoku University, which is one of the oldest Buddhist universities in Kyoto, Japan, and then became ordained as a Shin Buddhist priest in 2001. And now that I think about it, I must have appeared as quite a strange student to my professor and my friends because I was the only student who focused my study on social and contemporary Buddhism at that time. I started study engaged Buddhism during my undergraduate at Ryukoku University in order to research the development, uh, development of Buddhism law in contemporary society. However, I had to mainly focus my research uh, using English language material because there was very little material on engaged Buddhism written in Japanese language since this topic was uh, still a new topic that originated in the West. So 15 years ago, the engaged Buddhism was quite really new topic in Japan. So after concluding my uh, undergraduate study in Kyoto, I came to Berkeley to continue my studies and then went to Boston where I could do research in more challenging environment, both spiritually and academically on engaged Buddhism. This is the reason why I chose to study English and Buddhism in America. So currently I'm working at the BDK uh, or Numata Foundation in Tokyo uh, as a translator. So have you heard of my foundation before? Anyone knows about it? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my organization is famous uh, for the orange colored uh, book entitled uh, That Teaching of Buddha, that this book. So currently this book uh, has been translated to uh, 14, six different languages. And, and the more than 9 million copies have been distributed to the hotel, motels, and then school individual, even prison, uh, prison inmates throughout the world. So our founder, the late Japanese industrialist, uh, the devout Buddhist and then 1926 Cal student, uh, Cal graduate, Yehan Numata, uh, he envisioned the eventual English translation of the Buddhist Tripitaka scriptures and then started the BDK English Tripitaka translation project in Berkeley. And he established the Numata program in Buddhist studies at 15 major universities <coughs> throughout the world and the BDK postgraduate fellowship program. And then most recently, BDK founded the annual Toshi Prize for Best Buddhist Studies book. And thanks to his devotion to the Dhamma, uh, Mr. Numata established this uh, foundation for the most widespread academic program in Buddhist studies in the world. And then I'm so honored to be part of this region. After I finished my study in the US, I was planning to return to Yamaguchi to take over my temple family which my parents are currently taking care of, but I'm grateful to have been given this opportunity to join and then spend some time serving society while spreading an understanding of Buddhism throughout the world. By entering the real working world and serving society in my position at BDK, I desire to learn about people's life challenges and their problems, that and then how Buddhism can engage their human suffering. And for the past six years, I have had the opportunity to interact with the people throughout the world and learning and hearing about the myriad of challenges and desires from all segments of society. In the future, I will be able to go back to my temple in Yamaguchi and apply what I learn from everyone with my own temple members and my community. So let's move on to my short introduction of how the concept of the funeral Buddhism 
uh, developed in Japan. I think everyone knows uh, that Buddhism started in India was with the Shakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment 2,500 years ago. And can you imagine how Buddhism crossed the Asian continent and came to Japan without you know, modern day technology and convenient services like UPS or FedEx? Um, the Buddhism, how is, uh, how is it that Buddhism could travel such a long distance from the, you know, uh, without uh, television and newspaper and telephone or internet? So Buddhism uh, spread, uh, okay, here. So Buddhism spread through word or mouth of the people and culture, trade, and then art from India to China to Korea, and then to the island of Japan around the 6th century. At first, uh, Shinto religion, the indigenous religion of Japan, tried to portray Buddhism as a religion that worshipped a foreign god. But then the government and aristocracy realized that they could use Buddhism as a tool to control the people. No one really cared about the actual teaching of Buddhism at all at that time. Rather, people focused on its mysteriousness because Buddhism was something that came from outside Japan. As I said, Buddhism initially served as a tool for the ruling class. The status of Buddhist monks in those early days would be similar to today's federal government officials. Just anyone could not become a Buddhist monk without endorsement from the, the ruling class. So main responsibility for the, these early day Buddhist monks was to pray for the protection of the nation. So therefore, in those early days, uh, early years, uh, the Buddhism was not the religion for the common people. Buddhism was only for the uh, benefit of the aristocracy and then ruling class. So under these circumstances, Japanese Buddhism developed and then evolved through maintaining a relation, uh, close relationship with aristocracy. So in the 9th century, uh, two great Buddhist sects were created in Japan. So the Tendai school was founded by the Saicho and then Shingon school was uh, founded by Kukai. And through these two great Buddhist priests, people could study uh, the, the complicated Buddhist doctrine and then how to conduct the ritual in order to pray for the protection of the nation. And both Buddhist schools were dependent on the aristocracy for their existence and survival. However, around the 10th century, there were a few Buddhist monks who started to question the meaning of the teaching of the Buddha and their Buddhist way of life. They left their temple in the mountains and then went down to villages to share the Buddha's teaching with common folk. These monks came to be called hijiri, okay, hijiri. And then they conducted cremation, funerals, and memorial services for the dead. Those bodies had been discarded along the river banks at that time. The aristocracy that controlled the nation in Buddhism uh, disavowed the negativity associated with death. Therefore, early day Buddhist monks also avoided dealing with the death, and Japanese Buddhism was, this is the key, that Japanese Buddhism was originally not associated with conducting funeral or any ritual for death, except in the case of the death of the emperor or other aristocracy. So, however, it was these uh, Hijiri monks who challenged aristocratic Buddhism and then came about to actively conduct funeral ritual and memorial services for the common people. At this point, the relationship between Buddhism and a funeral became tightly interwoven in the mind of common people and a nation as a whole. In the 11th to 12th century, a huge religious revolution occurred in Japanese Buddhism. As I previously explained, Buddhism up until that time was only for the aristocratic people. However, during 11th and 12th century, many Buddhist monks realized the importance of sharing the teaching of Buddha with all people in society. They left their temples in mountains like Hijiri monks and established new Buddhist groups for the common people. And they were no longer just concerned about protection of the nation. At, the point, at this point, Buddhism finally became a religion for all people in Japan. After this great religious revolution in Japan, Buddhism became a great power base with many faithful followers. Uh, sometimes the power base of these new Buddhist sects terrified the nation and then its ruling class. However, during the Japanese war, uh, warring era, 15th to, 15th to 16th century, Buddhism became involved in various war because the shogun or military ruler tried to uh, to cast his authority and rule over the people in their lands by using Buddhism. If shogun or the uh, military ruler 
uh, establish a close relationship with the Buddhist sect, then its Buddhist follower would naturally support the shogun or military ruler. So at the same time, the most Buddhist sects also desire to maintain these kind of the strong relationship in order to mutually protect their status as well. So through these interwoven processes, uh, Buddhism maintained a distinct and unique relationship with both a ruling class and the common people in Japan. After warning letter in 17th century, the Japanese government issued a decree that every person had to become a supporting member of Buddhist temple. The ruler realized that the institution of Buddhism had spread to every part of Japan and therefore could become a useful tool in controlling the society through Buddhism. In effect, every Buddhist temple became a local office for the government. The temple had to maintain uh, exact re uh, membership records and then submit it them to the central government every year. Actually, this law was also used to exclude Christianity from, from Japan. At that time, Japan tried to create a cross feudal society based on uh, based only on Japanese culture, and the nation was cut off from any communication with nation and culture outside of Japan. So with the government mandate that uh, every person had to be belong to a uh, Buddhist temple, Buddhism was completely under direction and in control of the central government. In time, the government would issue a law which even allow Buddhist monks to marry and also allow them to eat and drink anything, despite traditional uh, Buddhist norms which forbid Buddhist monks from marrying, drinking alcohol, and eating meat. Most Japanese sects adapted these national laws into their respective traditions, and then this led to the development of hereditary system for passing temple responsibility down from one generation to the next. So usually uh, the father to eldest son, and then this tradition continues on this day. Actually, I'm also on these traditions. I'm the uh, 14th generation of Buddhist, uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist priests at the Choshoji Temple. So like Dalai Lama, right? 14th generation. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, my temple has uh, almost 400 years of history, so pretty long uh, years. But uh, the all my ancestors are the Buddhist priests, so it's kind of blood lineage and hereditary system. So, so uh, back to the, my uh, presentation. But, However, it is not true that uh, Buddhism always enjoyed the support of the Japanese government and ruling classes. During the 19th century, after another revolution called the uh, Meiji Restoration, uh, which led to the end of Japan's uh, feudal era took place, the nation's new ruler tried to create a new political system based on the native Shinto religion and then establishing the, the emperor as a Shinto god through state Shinto. As a result, many Buddhist temples and then Buddha statues were destroyed. And then Buddhist authority and influence in, Japan's, uh, uh, influence in Japanese society was reduced and deprived under the Haibutsu Kishaku, which means the abolish, and then abolish Buddhism and then destroy Shakyamuni Buddha movement, which was established by the new national leaders. With Buddhism's reduced law and then influence in Japanese society, the temple had to find some way to survive in society. Some Buddhist school changed their doctrine and then merged aspect of Shintoism into their teaching and then told it quote like, Buddha and Shinto God are the same, or that our primary teaching is to protect the emperor as God, etc. etc. So many you know, that Buddhist school had to change uh, their doctrine to support their you know, the status quo or the religious organization. So however, in spite of the tremendous pressure from the newly expanded power and influence of state Shinto, Buddhism did not lose its societal relationship and enroll with the end of life and funeral ritual. This is a really important point. Buddhism could only survive in this new society by continuing to engage in the funeral ritual since Shinto did not involve itself with death-related matter such as funeral and memorials. I think this was the cause why our Japanese Buddhist temple took on the law of the only dealing with the funeral and the memorial services, and then this created the concept of funeral Buddhism. After World War II, the concept of separation of state and religion was included in, included in the new Japanese constitution imposed by the United States. Buddhism was once again free to do various activities without any restriction or a pressure from the government. However, by this time, the concept that Buddhism was only engaged 
with the funeral ritual was tightly ingrained in both Buddhist priests and in people. And this is a reflection on the current status and then uh, role of the Japanese Buddhism in modern Japanese society. Also, the principle of the separation of religion and states imposed by the United States in modern era took on a different meaning than in the United States. In Japan, this law meant that religion should maintain a distance from the public and it could not play an active public role in society. Therefore, people did not have many opportunities to come in touch with religious uh, religions, including Buddhism, in the public. Additionally, Buddhist temples and priests maintained a distance from the common people, and then this created a complicated uh, Buddhist priest working situation within Japan. So today, Buddhism is uh, Buddhism in Japan mainly focuses on funeral rituals, memorial services, uh, ancestral remembrances such as obon, and then the saving of talisman for good luck, and then safe childbirth, and happiness, and safety. However, realizing the declining position of Buddhism in contemporary Japan, some young Buddhist priests are trying to implement various new activities and an idea to revitalize the teaching Buddha to dealing with contemporary 21st century issues and needs facing people in today's Japan. So I think uh, now I can move on to this topic. I think everyone was waiting to listen to this topic, so I'm sorry it took much time, so, but I, I had to explain the background of Japanese Buddhism. So, so the first one is this, now offering psychological support. So after the East, uh, Eastern Japan Great Earthquake and Tsunami in 2011, Many Buddhist priests began to focus on psychological dimension and the needs of victims. This became a cornerstone for the Japanese government to establish a new religious license called uh, Rin Shou Shu Kyoshi, so interface chaplain, so clinical religious chaplain. So this is a Japanese version of what would you probably call a chaplain in, in America. So according to Japanese requirements, this chaplain should be a member of a religious people, a uh, religious minister who respect others' values, view of life, and faith and practice compassion with nurture the positive power of living to assist those living in public facilities such as hospital, social uh, welfare facilities, and then areas suffering from a natural and mandate disaster without aiming to solicit or promote religious faith. With the cooperation with of the medical and social welfare staff as a team, chaplains should respect the religious background of the affected people and then their suffering and grief. And they must be available to provide both spiritual and then religious care where possible. This type of chaplain includes both the ideal of a, a Bihara priest or a Buddhist chaplain and a Christian chaplain. This person is required to go beyond religious sectarianism and then, then work together with Buddhists and non-Buddhists alike. This license curriculum was officially established in 2014 and then today those who have received this license are already working in various places with aim to reduce the suffering of the affected people. So next one is, so promoting the work and responsibility of contemporary Buddhist priests in today's uh, societies. So some Buddhist priests have been engaged in a variety of new activities and attempt to uh, revitalize the teaching of the Buddha to deal with the contemporary issue and modern societal needs. For example, uh, we find some Buddhist priests have established, established uh, hospices and nursing home and then provide 24 land the clock counseling services in Japan. Now, one very innovative pro uh, project is called Otera Oyatsu Club, uh, Tempo Manchi Club, <laughs> the Tempo Manchi Club, so which benefits modern Japanese society in very unique way. So organized as a Buddhist non-sectarian project to assist the fatherless or motherless Japanese families. So at a minimal cost, these temples, uh, families can be provided with some basic food staples such as rice and traditional Japanese sweets. Oftentimes, uh, temples have an overabundance of rice and then sweets that are brought to the temple as offering from temple members, and then at no cost to the temples. So these valuable uh, staples can be offered to those in need and not go to waste. This is important. So this unique activity has been spread into temples all over Japan. Currently, about 
800 temples and over 300 organizations are taking part in this project in Japan. And nearly 9,000 children look forward to receiving the switch from the club on a regular basis. So amazingly, young Buddhist priests are coming up with new and innovative way to reach the younger generation using various skillful means. So since World War II, the Japanese have been greatly influenced by American and Western music scene, and not only falling for the Beatles that visited 1966, but also adapted the 70s and 80s rock and roll and rock folk too. And then more recently, today's young Japanese are keen to American hip hop, and then have created Japanese language version of hip hop. So it didn't take a you know, long time for the musically inclined young Buddhist priest to create uh, the Japanese Buddhist hip hop as well. So right side, oh, this one, sorry. Uh, you see the Manchi Club the volunteer team, and then this one, hip hop chanting, and then. And uh, while most Japanese priests uh, everyday love like this, they tend to be a uh, very plain and uh, utilitarian through the centuries, uh, Japanese Buddhist uh, formal robes have evolved into beautiful vestment, costing tens of thousands of dollars nowadays, really expensive. But these be uh, beautiful robes may seem to be extravagant and in contradiction to how most people think of the Buddhist way of life. But understanding how this extravagance started gives new meaning and respect to these beautiful robes. So when Buddhism was beginning in Japan, many aristocratic women wanted to make some contribution or donation to the Buddhist priest and then to support the advancement of Buddhism. So they would donate, uh, they would donate their old silk robes or kimono and that you know, were no longer wearable to the priest. So these beautiful uh, silk kimono would then be cut up and then made uh, into the neck uh, supplies like this, like this, and then or the other vestment to be worn with the priest's simple robes. So therefore, these robes represent a sincere desire from the donor to offer something to the Buddha. And for the most part, today typical Japanese has no idea of this simple historical fact uh, of how the fancy priest robes came into being. So several temples in Japan have held a, this is an interesting event, a Buddhist priest robe and a vestment fashion show, the right side picture. And, uh, and then to preview the beautiful pattern and the silk materials used in the vestments and then to illustrate the idea of selfless giving in Buddhism. So another popular world, uh, worldwide interest based on the contemporary Japanese culture is uh, exploding uh, anime boom. So with young and creative Buddhist artists, uh, Buddhist anime is starting to make its appearance in every corner of the world. So world famous manga artist Tezuka Osamu, so who is considered the world Disney of Japanese animation, uh, created a Japanese manga or comi uh, comic book series called Buddha in 1972, and then continued this series for 10 years, so drawing on his interpretation of Life of Shakyamuni Buddha. So this theme was later followed by a three-part international award-winning anime movie, also called Buddha, which was first released in 2011 in honor of the 750th Memorial Observance for Shin Buddhist founder, uh, the Shinran Shonin. The second segment was issued in 2014, and the third and final installment is still due to be released. The Hongani Shin sect also produced an anime movie called Shinran Sama, so Shinran and his promise and the, the rights, which has been widely received by the, its members throughout the world. So entering uh, into 21st century has created the opportunity for temple and religious denomination to move into many new dimensions in, bring uh, in bringing the Buddhist teaching to the public. So one such uh, new idea is called Terakoya Buddha or uh, Temple School Buddha is part of what anthropologist uh, John Nelson of the University of San Francisco has termed in English as experimental Buddhism. So such recent activism has led Japanese mass media to great traditional Buddhist, uh, 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 mass media to give traditional, Buddhist, uh, traditional Buddhism renewed attention as well. So for example, TV Asahi, uh, one, of the, one of the big uh, TV production in Japan, uh, created a revolutionary and then challenging television show called Butcha Geji, as uh, the, the Dr. Uh, Paul Harrison explained. So Butcha literally means being frank temple. 
So which is hosted by the famous comedian, comedian duo uh, known as Bakshou Mondai. Uh, the top picture is the Bakshou Mondai duo, so comedian duo. And then the, in what has become a hit TV talk variety show, British priests sit face to face with the Bakshou Mondai duo and then invited the celebrity guests to openly discuss the state of contemporary Buddhism and then British history and practice and then tackle some questions from the viewers. In a quite contemporary scheme and then in what may be interested, uh, interpreted as a flashy uh, manner using well-known comedians, their message is to tell Japanese public that if something unpredictable or something they can handle happen in their lives, they can always come to the temple and the priest will welcome them anytime. In the same manner, we are also telling the priest that they have to do more studying and then become aware of contemporary concern and problems and need for the sake of the people and those who are suffering. So all of this newfound activism has led to the establishment of, of a very interesting specialty school that was established a uh, few years ago called Jushokujuku, uh, the Temple Head Priest Kram School. So at this school, a uh, Buddhist priest from any sect can learn how to manage a temple and then how to create new promotional materials and then enticing activities to bring the people to the temple. To date, over 500 young uh, from their 20 to 60s and then ambitious Buddhist priests from all over Japan have enrolled and then graduated from uh, this Kram school. These priests are now developing programs, uh, in programs and in activities based on what they learn at Kram school and are better able to engage members with their various needs and concerns. A more intimate look at Buddhism and how it can inspire one's life can be found at the uh, Terra Cafe or Temple Cafe. This one, the left side picture. We are priests from different sects uh, on site all day long at the Terra Cafe, a real and functioning restaurant. And then we'll freely talk to the cafe customers who uh, may wish to discuss something in their lives or a problem they may be experiencing with a Buddhist priest. This is no fee to talk to the priest, but the drinks and food are all real and then to be paid upon the completion of the meal. So not only can a person catch a good meal and then drink and then dessert, but also they can also try and find comfort for their life through the sharing their concern with the priest at the cafe. So in Tokyo, the Hongani sect operate the Ginza Salon, so right side pictures. So similar to Tera Cafe in Tokyo's high class Ginza district, uh, which is one of the world's uh, most extravagant business and uh, sub shopping areas where the shop shopper and office worker alike who are the interested in learning Buddhism and can attend uh, evening lecture and activities after shopping or their way, their way home. So Japanese funeral, the different topic, but uh, Japanese funeral are amongst world's uh, most expensive. So typically costing around $25,000. So three times as expensive as a typical American funeral. So a big portion of this amount goes, on to, uh, goes to the temple as a donation for the presentation of posthumous Buddhist name or title given to the deceased. As previously mentioned, Japanese family were required by law to be a member of Buddhist temple before, I mean, during the Hyudeo era. So while this law is no longer in effect, most family have maintained contact and an association with the same Buddhist temple generation after generation. However, with today's more mobile Japanese, uh, mobile Japanese society, and uh, with nearly one in five Japanese living in Tokyo area, so the, the traditional temple connection is no longer maintained for the death ritual or the uh, burial in many cases. So because of high cost involved to uh, have a funeral at the temple, uh, Buddhist temple, some families choose to have non-denominational -den or non-religious funeral memorial services at the funeral homes and then completely skip the Buddhist formalities. So in an effort to meet needs and desire of contemporary families living in the modern areas, I mean the living urban areas, uh, some Buddhist priests have taken to setting up a dire priest service where a person or family, probably without family tied to a certain temple, 
can call and then arrange, uh, arrange have a Buddhist service conducted by Buddhist priests either in their home, funeral home, or at the temple, I mean, Buddhist temple who are set fee. So rental priest service are also, ah, this one, uh, offered at a com uh, commercial website like Amazon.com or Rakuten, and usually come with a lower fee than going through the regular temple. And then there is no obligation for continued uh, association, uh, continued association after the request, uh, the requested services performed. So nowadays, some priests will enter into formal contract with families of deceased to conduct memorial services in memory of loved one up until uh, three, uh, 33rd year memorial. And then this type of the contract is usually finalized with upfront uh, payment in advance. So therefore, assuring uh, the continuing flow of income for the temple. So in today's electronic world, so young uh, Buddhist priests have set up cyber globes on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> the family can see the picture of their loved one on the anniversary day of their passing and hear the sutra chant in honor of the deceit. So or some temple offer temporary uh, graves or rental grave space for the temporary enshrinement of loved one's ash uran, of course a monthly rental fee. So and I'm sure many of you have seen picture or, or heard a story about the recent innovation uh, innovation robot priest. So with a shortage of working people in Japan, robots are turning up all over, helping with senior care, and then security concern, and a front desk greeting, and then valet for delivering product to the hotel guests, etc. And then now we find the robot capable of chanting a sutra, and then the striking the mokugyo, which could lead to possibly conducting funeral memorial services. As of the recent check I did, for now though, uh, I haven't heard any of the temple using a robot to conduct a service for now, but eventually the human interaction aspect of the we priest is still, still desired by the, our followers, at least for now, but I don't know what's going to happen in a few years. And so I think you must admit that uh, the today's young priests are being quite innovative and then creative in creating a new opportunities for the Buddhism to serve the needs of 21st century followers. And then who knows that what else will come into being in the coming 10 years. So ultimately, we hope all these newfound activities, program, and then energy will lead to the creation of a new law for Buddhism and Buddhist priests in Japanese society. And uh, lastly, um, please allow me to introduce you uh, a few of the special things I'm doing as a Buddhist priest to fulfill my obligation to the three treasures of Buddhism. Of course, um, besides I uh, explain, uh, introduced you just before, um, I'm engaging the many uh, activities I explained to you just before. But besides them, um, I have another, my private or my own special activity. So let me introduce about it. So of course, my primary emphasis is to serve the Buddha and then be here for the needs of my temple member and then Buddhist community. However, Rather than just officiating the temple and then home services, conducting funeral and other ritual, I want to incorporate all three aspects of three treasure or three gems in Buddhism for my life work. So for me, sharing the Dharma goes beyond just offering sermon and talks at my temple. I'm lucky to have the opportunity to be able to introduce Buddhism through English in Japan. Most Japanese have a uh, preconception that Buddhism is quite difficult to understand due to the complex Japanese Chinese term used in the teaching. However, as you know, Shakyamuni teachings are quite simple. So in order to change this misconception, I often use English word to explain uh, Buddhist doctrine. In the past, I have written a few books on Buddhism based on the linguistic. For example, it's one of my first books. Uh, my first publication, uh, Simple Buddhism in Simple English. So uh, just uh, uh, Dr. Paul Harrison explained like Cho Kantan, blah, blah, blah. This is the original version of the, the book. So the, this one is the edit to the Cho Kantan Ego de Bukkyo ga yoku wakaru. That literally means like uh, super easy to understand Buddhism in English. So that is uh, my newest books. Anyway, so I, on these books, I explain Shogyo Mujo. Shogyo Mujo as uh, uh, everything, including myself, is changing. This is my translation. But traditionally, Shogyo Mujo is usually translated as life is impermanent. 
But even that explanation is difficult to understand. So I extracted the original meaning from Buddhist teaching of the term and then created this explanation, which might be a little more understandable to the average person who uh, those knowledge of Buddhism might be very limited. English is quite straightforward, so it is easier for some Japanese people to understand the meaning of Buddhist term, hearing meaning in English rather than in Japanese or seeing Chinese character. So of course, in this case, English becomes a skillful means to learning Dhamma. Besides this, I also present Dhamma in English for Japanese audience those in, and those in other countries. So with these efforts, I hope to uh, share the Dhamma with the international audience. So another area I want to concentrate on is to encourage everyday people to use the teaching of Buddha in daily life. As I previously told you, I work for BDK or the Nimata Foundation. Also, this is a Buddhist foundation. The daily work I'm doing at this company is no different than the work that would have been done at the business operation. So oftentimes, I have to work until midnight in order to finish a project. And then I have so many bosses and then co-workers I don't like. And I have a lot of stress every day. So however, I'm able to deal with the stress through you know, what the Dhamma offered to me in my life. So to help today's uh, stressed out office workers, it's my pleasure to be able to share this understanding with those who are here uh, working in today's stressful Japanese society. Uh, at the invitation of the various employers, I am given the opportunity to share Dharma with employees at the company on how by ordering their self-centered mind to a selfless outlook and they can reduce their own stress and in increase productivity. When I actually, the next week I'm going back to Japan, but I have been asked by the major Japanese airline company to teach their cabin attendants um, how the we Japanese are surrounded by Buddhist teaching in our daily life. And hopefully this understanding re will reinforce their own effort to offer the omotenashi or the wonderful Japanese skill and then philosophy of uh, hospitality. So my, my second area of emphasis is to use different medium to share Dhamma and then, uh, then reach those who may have thought Buddhism was only inside the temple. So besides just uh, approaching office workers, I also have the opportunity to present Buddhism on television as well, uh, including the, the Buddha Keji. So I appear on local one hour TV program once a month. Uh, which includes a 10-minute segment where I can explain some aspect or share the Buddhist teaching with the audience. So here's some of the uh, sample. Okay, good. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> I'm explaining the Japanese typical word, akirameru. But uh, usually, uh, it means uh, give, give up. But uh, this term is originally a uh, Buddhist term, so I explain about it. In Buddhism, akirameru means to truth or to clarify the truth. That's the real, real meaning. But uh, somehow, uh, in modern Japanese terms, uh, we use that akirameru is as a give, give up or giving up. So, but the real meaning is a uh, clarify the truth. But key point is what is truth? Truth is we can control everything. So everything changing. So we can control as we wish. That's the meaning. So that meaning, uh, you know, develop as a giving up in Japan. So, but the original meaning in the Buddhist term. So, like this. Uh, or oh, probably you can continue more, but I, I'm going to stop it. Otherwise, you know, my time is you know, lined up, so <laughs> sorry about that, I'll stop it. Sorry, I don't know how to use it. Sorry. So like this, I'm sneakily teach Buddhism, so <laughs> not directly, so sneakily, you know, I'm kind of indirectly, indirect, indirect way to teach Buddhism. So this is a, you know, kind of the tendency like Japanese people like, so yeah, this is one of my activities, so. And then my third area, this is my second area, my third area of the emphasis uh, uh, is to engage my temple sangha. So this is the uh, most important thing. So my temple sangha and my temple and then local people and then serve their needs. So this is what I want to do. So my temple is located in the countryside, as, the, as I told you. And then, then I, it's a small town and then with only about 6,000 people. 
And most of people and my member are the elderly. So even though my town has two clinics, okay, two medical clinics, uh, the doctor at the, the clinics, both clinics are over the 80 years old. <laughs> And then realizing that my town needs uh, additional medical services, and then I open up my temple and then arrange, uh, arrange the, some primary medical services right inside my temple from my uh, uh, about three years ago. <coughs> so I invited the doctor from the nearby larger town to come to my temple and then give free medical checkups and then counseling my members and then town folk. And after their health checkup, I concluded the uh, afternoon with Dhamma talk. So health is composed of both uh, body and then spiritual well-being. So I started this medical Buddhist gathering. So usually about 30 people came uh, come to gathering to take advantage of this new concept of for the Buddhist temple. So another big issue in my town and in Japan as well is dementia in an you know, ever-growing senior population. I started a monthly dementia cafe uh, gathering at my temple to offer <laughs> and then support understanding in my town. The cafe provides opportunity for everyone, including the patient, their family, and then caregiver, uh, givers to come get together and then share their worry, concern, and hardship with other living with uh, under, uh, others who are living under the same conditions. So I also invite the huge doctor and then local government official dealing with senior care and then senior issue to come this temple gathering. So in conclusion, so with a sense of renewed purpose and then deal, we can see the reemergence of Buddhism once again, reaching out and serving the needs of masses and then going beyond the old conservative tradition that focused on only on the, the funeral or death. So in my own work, I have tried to incorporate the three treasured Buddha Dhamma Sangha and awaken each of these treasures in my members by inspiring uh, strangers and then comfort and appreciation for life as they face each of day of their lives. So in conclusion, I believe this rebirth is what engaged Buddhism for Japan is all about. So thank you again for inviting me to share this with you today. Thank you.